Hi, Corey Geiger along with Neil Riddell, our weekly PSU presser video. Neil, Bill O'Brien was pretty candid and honest today. I thought it was a terrific press conference for him. He set the tone. We wondered if he'd be angry or short or whatever after the 63-14 to 14 loss, but he came out and was uh, pretty open and honest about a lot of things. Yeah, he said after the Ohio State game he would answer questions about about the game on Tuesday. He wanted to have a chance to digest things. And, I mean, I think that's kind of smart, but, you know, you're in the, in, even though you've had plenty of time to figure out what you're going to say when you're down 50, um, you know, he wanted to digest it. And, uh, you know, I think everything kind of came up that uh, has been talked about this week. The thing that struck me is how he talked about how much he learned from watching the film about the job that he can do, uh, you know, on both sides of the ball. And he's a second-year head coach. He's doing an excellent job all around, but his game day – uh, decision making and all of those things. That's all still a work in progress, as you would expect, really, with anyone. The news of the day is that Christian Hackenberg is okay. The shoulder's okay. He practiced Monday. Uh, he should be good to go on Saturday. So that's really the most important thing that came out of the day from a news standpoint. But he also defended defensive coordinator John Butler. He said that's crap if anybody is criticizing John Butler. Uh, this after Penn State gave up 63 points and 686 yards of offense. But Bill O'Brien is standing behind his defensive coordinator. Yeah, and he talked about um, simplifying the situation, coaching them better. I mean, he, he didn't sugarcoat the fact that they can't feel good about how they played on defense. And it seemed like he spent a little bit more time maybe going over that with Butler. He said they have a regular, you know, they're talking constantly all day long, two or three times a day in, in meetings. But he, he hit on the simplification, letting players play. They moved Adrian Amos, it sounds like, semi-permanently back to cornerback. So I think that he, you know, the, he addressed the confusion aspect that way. He did acknowledge there were communication issues on defense, which obviously there were with wide open receivers really all, all over the field. Now, I think it's important that you mentioned that he is in constant communication with John Butler because I think we look at Bill O'Brien as an offensive guy and he's the offensive coordinator but that doesn't mean that he can just let the defense go do whatever it wants and the way he described it today is that he has very much uh, is very involved with what the defense is doing yeah he's addressed this during the season he's been asked a couple different times you know you're a play caller you're an offensive coordinator how much time do you know where the defensive meeting room is <laughs> you know kidding around and he said yeah you know he's pretty much spends half his day working on the defense and then he then he works over on the you know so he's kind of addressed this now what I don't think they can get a free pass on because everybody's focusing on the defense is the offense if you're going to com compete with that Ohio State team you got to go in there and score close to 30 points I mean that's that wasn't a great Ohio State defense and I I asked Bill about that if you're going to play these high scoring teams your offense has to give your defense a better chance, and, and he put the blame on himself because he's the play caller, and, and he took ownership for that. Yeah, and I think this is the pattern that most head coaches do. They don't like it when their assistant coaches get criticized, whether it's on message boards or in the mainstream media or whatnot. So they, and Joe was the same way. He said, put the blame on me. I'm the guy who's – it's my responsibility. And, and, but he did say, he said, they didn't score an offensive touchdown. It was 21 nothing. So, uh, and then the, the special teams unit gave up a 50-yard kickoff return. So, he, he said they didn't give their defense much of a chance to settle into that game. Right. A lot of stuff happened uh, on Saturday. He addressed many other things. Any, anything else really stick out other than kind of defending Butler? And he talked about Zwinak. Uh, that, you know, it's a competitive position, and right now he, he named Belton the starter. I mean, he referred to Belton as their starter, really, for the first time this year. So, uh, and he, you know, even though he and Zwinak met yesterday, Zwinak's a very emotional kid. He said that it's a competitive situation, and you hope that he can work through it, but some of it uh, has become a mental issue, and then he has to, uh, he has to work his way through it. Jobs are up for grabs. I believe the number was like 17 oars on the depth chart between the first and second teamers or the second and third teamers, including left tackle Donovan Smith, who many of us, you look at Donovan Smith, he's a mountain of a man. He kind of looks like a prototypical star NFL left tackle. He may lose his job this weekend. Now, he's listed as or with Gary Gilliam. Yeah, they're trying to create competition. And, hey, you get beat by 49 points, that's what you got to do. Uh, I don't think this staff is just sitting back, shrugging their shoulders, feeling sorry for themselves, saying, hey, look what the NCAA did to us. 
I think they're trying to uh, reevaluate different situations. Uh, you know, whether it's with Donovan Smith, the Gary Gilliam's available to the media this week. He may start. Uh, Grass is in the mix. So I think they're trying to uh, to regroup. I think they have the perfect opponent to do that against. Um, you know, Illinois will have their this coaching staff's attention, and Illinois is a struggling team, so that timing is good. You're talking about an Illinois team that just lost 42 to three. Who knows if Tim Beckman's going to be around at the end of the year? It's a perfect opponent. Yeah. I think Penn State blows them out. I got like 35 13. We'll probably see the defense play a lot better, uh, and then they'll feel good about themselves because that's what football is. Uh, so I'm going to go 35 13. I think they're going to have a big win. Yeah, I said 31 uh, 17. Um, you know, and really, this is the stretch that they need to get well and take some some um, and regroup here. You know, you can't feel great about losing as badly as they did against Ohio State, but there's three winnable games in a row here with Illinois, Minnesota, which has improved, and then Purdue coming in. So, in order to finish any better than seven and five, they need to get it together quickly. Many people may be wondering about that Minnesota game. Minnesota six and two. They average 123 yards passing. So if you're looking, thinking that, and hey, they could lose out there, no doubt about it, but it's going to take a team that can throw the ball to beat Penn State. So there is a chance here for a, a little winning streak. Yeah. Well, I mean, who are Minnesota's most famous quarterbacks? Fran Tarkington and Joe Cap, right? <laughs> they were both running quarterbacks. That actually, probably most of our audience has no, you. has no idea who those Mike, people Mike are. Mike Boydham's doing our video. He does a great job with our game day. I'm sure he's heard of at least one of them. <laughs> My dad's Dale. a Vikings fan. <laughs> and Fran Tarkenton. For Dale, of Corey Geiger and Mike Boydham on the uh, video. Thanks for tuning in.